So if you have been using stable diffusion for a while now, you may have heard the word control net pop up a lot. And it seems like the chosen technique to just instantly make your images look better. Perhaps the most confusing part about it is that it does so many things that really pinpointing and describing what it does is very complicated. So in this video, I hope to show you how to install control net and give you a few different examples of the different ways that you can use it. So to begin, we're going to go to the SD web UI control net GitHub page, go to code HTTPS, and then copy the link here. Once you've got that link, you want to go to extensions, install from URL, and then paste it in there, press install. And once you've installed it, you want to apply and restart UI. Now, once you've got that extension installed, you still need to download the models. So you want to come to this hugging face page. And remember how I was saying that control net, it's very hard to pinpoint what it does. The reason for that is this, because if you look, all these path files that you see over here are technically all different ways that you can use control net. So in this video, I'll only be showing you how six of them work. I recommend that you come back and experiment with all the different models that are on this page. So for this tutorial, you'll want to download the depth path file, the canny path file, the MLSD path file, the open pose path file, the seg path file, and the soft edge path file. And to download them, you can do that by just clicking the button over here. Once you've done that, you want to go into your stable diffusion web UI folder, go to models, control net, and then paste in all the files that you've just downloaded into this directory here. Once you've done that, you should be all ready to start using control net. And I'll begin walking through what each of the six models that we've just downloaded does. So to begin, I'm in the image to image tab and I have this picture of a person playing guitar. And what I'm hoping to achieve by using this prompt is get a more futuristic looking image. So I'm going to generate this image. Now this was the image I was able to generate. Now it does look very good. Let's say for example, that I wanted to actually keep the posture of the person playing and use that as a template to actually make this image. To do this, I could load the denoising strength. What that would do would basically mean that our images wouldn't have as much of the dramatic change that we are looking for, which is not our aim. We just want to completely change the whole image, but keep the same posture. To do this, we use control net open pose. So if you scroll down, you should be able to see control net here. Now click on it. You want to for preprocessor, you want to click open pose model. You'll also want to click open pose. Now click enable it to enable it and click pixel perfect. Now, if I go and click generate, you see that we were able to change the image completely, but this time we were able to keep the actual posture of the person. And the reason we were able to do this when we use open pose, first stable diffusion analyzes the image and generates this diagram over here. And what this diagram shows is the actual posture of the person and each colored line actually denotes something. Once the image is analyzed, the stable diffusion uses that as a base to generate the actual final image. Now, the great thing about open pose, once you've got that posture image, we could go into something like texture image, use control net again, and actually drag in that posture image. And we'll actually be able to use it as a template for all our other images as well. And so what this allows us to do is take any image, AI generated or not, and use it as a template to actually make new images. And if you scroll down, we can go into some of the settings. So control weight, just essentially the same way how weights work in normal prompts, will change how much influence the actual pose has on the final image. Starting control step and ending control step. What that does is we could change when the actual influence of open pose actually starts kicking in. So if I set this to 50, then when it's generating the image, it won't be influenced by open pose until it reaches 50% of actually generating the image. Once it does that, then it'll start finally being influenced by open pose and the image will change accordingly. But as it's not being influenced throughout the whole image, the actual final result may not closely follow the actual posture. And likewise, what I could do is bring this back to zero and make it so that it's only 0 0.2. And so what I'm saying here is at the beginning, it's going to be influenced by the posture that we've given it. After it reaches 20%, 
it won't look at that anymore. And so it's a possibility that the posture itself has more room to actually change because it's sort of not tied down to that anymore. There is also a low VRAM option if you're getting memory errors. And you also notice that before we actually started generating, I said to click on Pixel Perfect. And the reason for that is if you do that, you won't have to mess around with actually getting the right resolution on your images. By keeping it Pixel Perfect, you'll be able to automatically match the image. And just to reiterate, let's say you really want to use the pose again in further images. All you have to do is scroll and on this file here, so on the actual pose file, right click, save as, and then you want to scroll and then when it says dropped image here, all you want to do is drag your image and then you can use the actual pose in further images. So moving on, let's say we want to actually keep more than the, just the actual posture of the image. Let's say we want to keep the actual structure of the guitar we used or the actual clothes he's wearing or the way his face is turned. We can't do this with open pose, but there is other options. So if you scroll back down, so this time, instead of using open pose, you want to change that to soft edge HED safe. And for the bottom, you want to actually click soft edge. Now, if I go and generate my image, now what you'll be able to see is that the image looks a lot more closer than it did when we were using open pose. So stuff like the guitar itself actually looks a lot more similar than it did previously. And the reason for this, instead of actually generating just the actual posture of the person, Stable Diffusion analyzed the image and generated this sort of soft drawing of the actual person. Then using this as a template, it generated the final image. So Soft Edge is great for if you want the actual final image to resemble your input image, but not too much so that it allows Stable Diffusion to be a bit creative with the way it works. And if you scroll down, you'll see the standard settings that we talked about before. So you have stuff like Control Weight, Starting Control Step, Ending Control Step, and all the others. Now, if you scroll back up, let's say instead of loosely resembling the image, we want more resemblance. Now, we can't do this with Soft Edge. Instead, what we do this with would be a model called Canny. So, if you scroll back down, for the preprocessor, select Canny. And for the actual model itself, select Canny. Now, if I go and click Generate again, now if you look at the actual generated images, ignore the face you can see that it resembles the input image a lot more this time. And the reason for this, instead of doing the soft lines like we saw with Soft Edge, Kani actually gives it hard lines to actually work with. And the reason why his actual face matches this time. So the position of his face, how he's slightly tilted towards us, Kani was able to pick up on that and it's shown in the actual final image. And the great thing about Kani is that we can actually modify the amount of lines that show up in the final image and what I mean by this is that if you scroll down, you'll have these two values along the standard values that you come to expect. So we have canny low threshold and canny high threshold. And in a nutshell, everything below canny low threshold is discarded. Everything above canny high threshold is kept. And everything in between, stable diffusion decides whether to keep those specific lines or not. So what I could do is if I wanted even more lines, is that I could take this canny low threshold down and take the canny high threshold all the way down too. And what I'm essentially saying with this is that everything above the threshold of one, which is virtually everything, all those lines keep them. And the effect of this you'll see right now. So if I go click generate, so we generated our image, but now if you actually look at the canny map, you can instantly see the canny just sort of went haywire and sort of drawed all the lines that it could see. And if you look closely, you can actually make out the person from the input image. And if I wanted it so that I didn't have the lot of lines with Kani, I could just scroll back down, set the low threshold really high, set the high threshold really high as well, go back and click generate. Now this time what you should be able to see is that the actual lines that we have are very little compared to what we just had recently. And so I don't recommend that you use Kani with extreme values like I just did. Instead, just always keep it around the default values, which I believe is around 100 and 200. And you should be okay for most scenarios. Now you'll see this time I've changed the actual input image and the prompt. So this time I'm using Cyberpunk City and I've changed the actual image to a photo of the city. Kani is great and all, but the lines it generates are curvy and actually bend towards the actual image itself. 
Let's say we didn't want that. Let's say we wanted the lines to actually just be straight. And this could become useful for stuff like buildings or architectures, because traditionally those are made to have very straight lines. So to do this, I wouldn't use Kani. Instead, I would use something called MLST. So if you scroll back down again, and this time for preprocessor, click MLST. And for the actual model itself, also click MLST. And now if I go and click generate, the image was generated, but now if you actually look at the lines the image was given to work with, you could see instead of how Kani was very wavy and the lines went straight, now we have very hard and straight lines to work with. And so this is just an alternative to Kani if you don't want the actual lines in your image to be influenced by the curves within the actual image itself. And if you scroll back down, you can actually influence the amount of lines actually shown up in your image by using stuff like the Q value threshold and the hue distance threshold. So sort of similar to the way the Kani low threshold and high threshold worked, if you adjust these values over here, you'll be able to affect the amount of lines within your actual image. Now let's say that you are just tired of lines altogether and you don't want to use lines within your image. You don't want stable diffusion to have to work with rigid lines. And instead you want it to be able to work with sort of softer parameters. Sort of like softer edge, we have another alternative and this time it's called depth. So if you scroll back down and this time for preprocessor, you click on depth instead. Note this time you actually have multiple depth files to pick from. So this time just click on depth Midas and for the model itself, just click on depth. And now if I go click generate, the image was generated, but this time instead of having hard and soft lines to work with, stable diffusion just gave it a sort of soft template to work with. And so depth is really useful if you want to get the actual outlines of the actual objects within your images without picking up on all the extra details that Kani or MLSD would have actually picked up on. Now the last model I'm going to show you today is a bit more trickier to use than the rest. And personally, I'm still trying to figure it out properly. And it's called segmentation. So before we begin, I've actually changed the image itself. So this time it's of a car and in the prompt, I put in a red car. Now to explain segmentation is probably easier just to actually show you. So if you scroll down and this time for preprocessor, select seg. And if you notice this time, you actually have three options to pick from, like we did with depth. So for this tutorial, you want to click on the middle one. If you do want to use the other two, that's fine as well, but you may just have to wait a while as the models are downloaded automatically to your PC. So selecting the middle one, and now for model, you'll also want to click seg. And now if you scroll to the top and generate the image. Now this was the image we were able to generate and it is a red cause, so the prompt did work well. But the more important thing you should notice is that stable diffusion actually generated a segmentation image this time. So it looked at the car and was able to segment all the different parts within the image. So right here we have the car, now we have the road, and we have the trees in the back. And these colors actually all mean something. So this shade of blue that was used was used on purpose. And if you go to this Excel sheet, which I'll link in the description below, it basically highlights what each color actually represents. And the way segmentation works is that once it's segmented the image, you should be actually be able to mention the object by name as long as it's actually in the Excel spreadsheet. And Stable Diffusion will actually just change that part of the image. You can see that it's a really powerful tool once you get to know how to use it properly. And so that's all for today's tutorial. Let me know if you found it useful and I'll see you in the next video.